Thanks, everybody. Wow, I'm really glad to be here. If my voice is too loud or too soft, if you just let me know. I also really appreciate a chance to talk with young people about this because you'll find out at the end of the talk I have a hidden or ulterior motive for talking with you tonight, and I'll share that during the last slide. Um, as Bob said, this is actually a part of my regular job. This is what I do for a living. I'm what's called a public health doctor. Public health doctors treat the population rather than each individual patient, although we do see individual patients in the middle of an outbreak, like the one we're having now. You may wonder what the big deal is. Um, what is the big deal about H1N1? We're gonna talk about that tonight, and I'm gonna try to go through the information relatively quickly, so you can ask questions, or we can get off the topic a little bit and talk about something that I haven't raised about the topic of flu. Why is the flu a big deal? Who cares? Every year we have the flu. What's the big deal this year? You've heard of the flu before. In fact, you may have already had a flu shot at some point in your life, or more than one. So why are we so excited about the flu this year? Well, the reason docs like me are excited about it is because even though it's normal and it's a part of our lives and we accept it, it actually puts about 225,000 Americans in the hospital every year and every year, 36,000 people lose their lives to influenza. So even though it seems normal and we sort of get used to it, it's a pretty big deal from a public health doctor's perspective because we'd like to prevent those folks from having to go to the hospital or getting really sick or dying of the flu. So every year we do a big media campaign and we have big clinics and we talk with doctors and patients and we have news ads because this is a big deal to us. It's a lot of people to lose every year to a disease that can be prevented with a vaccine. How many people in this room think you've actually had the flu? The influenza big flu, okay. People my age, people in their 50s, have probably had it three or four times. Younger people, maybe not so often. But it's such a serious disease when people get it that they don't not know it. So for example, if I'm talking to you and you say to me, I think I have the flu. I'm a little warm and my head hurts. If you and I are talking like that and you look pretty good, I'm pretty sure you don't have the flu. Most people know after they had the flu because they had to lie down, they had to sleep, sometimes for days, and they felt as bad as they've ever felt. And when you're in the middle of a flu illness, you can see how someone might die of it. You can think, you know, this could just get worse and worse. So if you've really had the flu, you don't forget about it, you remember it, it may have been the sickest you ever were in your life. It starts off in your, in your um, nose, your throat, and your lungs, and it actually kills the cells that line your tract that you breathe through. And that's why it hurts so much when you breathe, that's why you cough, that's why lots of things start to break up in your lungs a week or two later. You literally lose the whole lining of your lungs and your airways, and it has to grow back. It's a big deal, and that's the way it usually enters our body too, is through our, our breathing tubes. We mentioned how many people were hospitalized, over 200,000 every year and 36,000 deaths. And there are many different flus. I think influenza is one of the most interesting viruses I've ever heard of. It's very different than other viruses. Like when you were a kid, you probably got vaccines. If you're one of these kids that gets all their vaccines, you probably got a vaccine for measles and you probably got a vaccine for lockjaw or tetanus and you probably didn't think too much about that. But those viruses don't really change. They stay the same. The cavemen who had measles, the guy who had measles a thousand years ago, probably had the same measles virus you could get if you weren't vaccinated. But the flu virus is so special that it changes so quickly that the flu virus you give me when you're sick may not be the one you got. It's a little bit different. Even during the time it infects you, it can change a little bit. A virus that can change that fast can trick the immune system 
very easily. Here's a picture. It's not really a picture. It's an electron micrograph. You can use an electron microscope to take a picture of things that are so small you can't use light because they're too little. You can't light them bright enough to see them. So you have to spray them with a thin coat of metal and then bounce little electrodes or electric particles off of them and you get sort of a pattern. But what does this look like to you? If you had to guess, what is it like? It, it's a ball, right? It's a, it's a sphere. And it has what? Do you see these little things sticking off of it? It has like little knobs that poke out of this little round sphere. There's two kinds of little knobs. One makes a protein that allows it to stick to cells. And it's very specific. Usually it's for that animal, like a person or a pig or a bird. And the other little knob on it allows it to burst out of the cell after it's done its dirty work, which is to make millions and millions of copies of itself. Now, if you look at that, that tiny little, that sphere right there, it's so tiny that we couldn't even represent it. If, if this building was a bacteria, it would still be too tiny for me to show you how small it is. So we have to use a special microscope. Now, how could something that tiny be that dangerous? Um, people have joked that viruses aren't really alive. They can't live by themselves at all. They can hardly do anything alone. They have to get inside one of your cells. They have to lay down some proteins on your genetic material. And they use your cell's machinery to make copies of themselves. So they take over all the cellular machinery, start turning out millions of copies of themselves until, they bur until the cell bursts, and millions of viruses are released. And each of those viruses goes to another cell. Now, something you might think of is, well, how does that end? I mean, how do you stop something like that? Well, every day, all day, you have an amazing army that circulates in every tissue of your body virtually that is looking for an invader, any invader. It could be a virus, it could be something that, it could be a bacteria from your mouth, or it could be something you ate that had something in it that was bad for you. This immune system, this, this system of immune warriors is circulating 24 seven. Very powerful system, very good at what it does but it has to make special weapons and turn out special soldiers to get rid of these. So that's why you feel pretty terrible for a few days and you're not sure how you're gonna do. You're like, could this get worse if you have the real flu while your immune system is being mobilized. Once your immune system is mobilized, um, it's curtains for the virus or the germ. 99.9% .9 of the time, your immune system wins. It wins against viruses, it wins against bacteria, and it wins against cancer. Your immune system is the system that captures and destroys cells that are misbehaving, who might like to be cancer someday. It destroys them because they don't look right once they begin to grow too much. So the, I want you to sort of appreciate that this is such a simple organism that it's very hard for the immune system to kill it unless it's seen it before. And if it's seen it before, those warriors and those equipment, those weapons, they're just waiting. They're waiting for that flu virus. The flu vaccine, if you've ever taken a flu vaccine, it's really just a training program for your immune system. You inject a flu virus that's dead or that's very crippled and can't cause disease, you inject that and your immune system thinks for about a day or two that it's real flu. Some people say they feel funny after they get a flu shot, and the doctor will tell you, no, no, it doesn't make you get flu. The flu shot doesn't give you flu, it doesn't give you flu. But I actually think people do feel different after their flu shot sometimes, because your immune system doesn't know it's a training program. It thinks that a terribly dangerous virus is on board, 
and it starts to make lots of active proteins to give you a fever, to make you feel sleepy, or to make you feel energetic. So I've had people tell me the day after their flu shot, they feel fabulous. They feel great. And other people tell me, the day after my flu shot, all I wanted to do was sleep. And I think that's a way of, of finding out how does your body respond when it thinks that the worst enemy has gotten in and we are going to fight for our lives. The flu is here. We're going to fight for our lives. So the, the flu shot's just a training program. If you don't have a training program, your immune system will figure this virus out, but it takes longer and you'll get sicker and it'll be several days before it's obvious that the immune system is winning. I think I'm pointing this wrong. Okay, so what's the big deal about H1N1? It's just another flu year. Why are we so excited? Why is the newspaper full of these stories every single day? What's the big deal? Well, it turns out this is what's called a major change in flu viruses. Flu viruses change a little bit all the time. Remember I said maybe the flu virus you get isn't the one you give? They change a little bit. That's called a drift, a slight change. H1N1 is what's called a shift. It's a big change. And the only people who've ever seen this virus are over 65, or at least they were born after 1950. That's the closest we can pinpoint it. So most of us are walking around, and you know those soldiers I told you about, all those weapons, all that equipment? They've never seen it before. So the first time they see it is when it gets you. And so people get pretty, pretty ill. It's mild compared to what could happen. But still, lots of people are getting it, and lots of people feel sick for several days. A few people have to be hospitalized. Very small number of people may go on not to be able to survive and to die of the virus. Now, one thing I want you to realize is this is not the normal flu season. The normal flu season is at Christmas time or in January. The flu circles in New Mexico usually in December or January, but this flu. It started in March. What's that about? Started in March and it's hung around all summer long. That's just weird. But that's what a new viral shift does. It doesn't behave like normal flu. And sometimes it goes through and it's real mild. Remember when it first started in Mexico? They had it in Mexico and a lot of people got it. And it looked pretty mild, actually. Even in Mexico it was relatively mild. But the fear was it'll come back with a roar in the winter. Well, it's here. In fact, it never left. It's still spreading among the population. So far, it's been mild, and I sure hope it stays that way. But as you might imagine, if you infect 500,000 people with it, even a few seriously ill people might go on to have to be hospitalized, and a few people might die, because the number of people getting it is so big. So far, this virus looks mild for most people. Mild meaning you didn't need to go to the hospital. And you didn't have, you weren't, your life wasn't threatened by the virus, even though you might feel quite sick. Now here we go. If you give your friend a drink of your Coke, can you give them the flu? Probably not, okay? This isn't one of those kinds of viruses. This virus likes to spread in the air. So if you're in a car with somebody and you drive for three hours and through the whole drive they're coughing and sneezing, you might very well get the flu from them if they have the flu. Or if you live in a house with somebody close to them, your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sisters, and they get really sick, we tend to share the air in our houses. We tend to move through each other's space. And we might be in the same bathroom or the same kitchen, the same bedroom. So we often get it through little floating uh, particles in the air. You can also get it indirectly. Like, let's say that I talk on the phone, and I'm talking on the phone, and then I put it down. Somebody else comes, and they talk on the phone. And I'm sick, and I touch that phone with my hand, which I'd been rubbing my eyes and my nose with before. So now they're talking on the phone, and then they, with their hand, rub their eyes or scratch their nose. We call that inoculation. We've just given ourselves the flu because it can live for a few hours on surfaces that are handled by our hands or if we've, for example, blown our noses on a Kleenex and then someone else handles that Kleenex pretty quickly. It can spread via an object.
This is a man sneezing. Now, you wouldn't think that a sneeze would be that big of a deal. Um, but in fact, he's just sent too many little particles to count, floating out into the air. Over several days, or over several hours, they will drift down and dry out and they'll die. But when he first sneezes, and if he sneezes again in 10 minutes and again, pretty soon, it's like a little, a little universe of little particles of mucus that have virus in them. So you can see if somebody walks over to you and achoo, sneezes very close to you, that's a pretty scary thing because that cloud with these active viral particles that came from their respiratory tract is now floating around in the air. Thus, the special sneeze. I heard this was called the Dracula sneeze. Have you heard that? Achoo, where you sneeze into your arm like Dracula pulls his cape up like that. Um, and I think that's because vampires are very much in the media right now, so people are thinking it reminds them of Dracula. But you can see why it's very hard to defend yourself against this, even if you wash your hands. So what we're mostly recommending is if you're sick with sneezing and coughing and a fever and a sore throat, we'd like you to stay away from most people. And if your family's taking care of you, we'd like them to wash their hands and to get as much fresh air into the room as they can. Now, what we'd usually do to prevent this is we give you a vaccine, but there's a problem with that this year. This virus was f discovered in March and April of, of the spring, and it takes about eight months usually to make a vaccine. So we're running as fast as we can, but it's still not fast enough because that virus is already here and it's already spreading in our own population. The vaccine is coming. And I really encourage folks who are comfortable with this to get a flu vaccine against H1N1 and regular flu too, which we expect may come around its normal time, December, January. Mm -hmm. Hi, Hello. come on in. How many of you have had, the, you said you'd had the flu. What's the thing you remember the most? What was the worst symptom? The people that have had real flu. Body aches. Body aches. Everything hurts. Your teeth hurt, your hair hurts, your scalp hurts, everything hurts. The reason everything hurts is your body makes this powerful, powerful set of proteins that activate the immune system, but they also make everything hurt. So you're making this, this wonderful army of chemicals and cells and antibodies and things to make your temperature go up and things to make the blood vessels get very sensitive, but it just does hurt. It hurts to have your immune system fighting a big battle like this. So if you have fever with a cough or sore throat or both, it's likely this time of year that you could have the flu. You might have a mild cold, especially if you don't have any fever and you really don't feel that bad. You might just have a regular cold. Some people get a cold this time of year. And then some people complain about a runny nose, body aches, headaches, chills, fatigue. Um, when I say fatigue, you're just, you just feel out of it. You just, you feel very tired and everything hurts. Chills are where you feel hot for a minute and then you're just really like, I need more covers, I'm really cold. Fever and chills is what your body does. It alternates between them in order to make it a hostile environment for the invading virus. So your body causes the fever to get to the virus and to make it hard for it to grow. And then sometimes people feel so sick that they'll even throw up or they'll have very, very fast moving stools and they won't feel good at all. They'll think that they ate something that doesn't agree with them. But in fact, it's just the bodies of the cell responding very strongly to the invading virus. Sometimes people don't get a fever. If you're quite ill, even if you don't have a fever, you should talk with your parents or your family about that. Some people don't get the, a fever with the flu. It's unusual, but it happens. There is a vaccine. I'm hoping that you all consider to get the vaccine. It's different than the regular flu vaccine that comes every year. And that regular flu vaccine is actually already here. Many doctors and clinics have it, not everybody yet. Um, but there's a seasonal flu vaccine which you can get and there's a second flu vaccine which I'd also like you to consider. The second flu vaccine, if you're less than 10 years of age, you'll need to get two. That's actually true of the regular seasonal flu too because your immune system is still developing when you're eight or nine or 10 and so you might need two doses in order to protect you. 
There's a new version of the vaccine that you can take through a spray in your nose, and you don't have to get a shot at all. You just get this little nasal spray in your nose, and that uh, allows your body to prepare too, because it's a preparation of the virus that's in the nasal spray. There are some special medicines that you can also use for the flu. And these are special in that they do hold the flu back for a while until your immune system can come roaring in with all the soldiers and all the equipment and all the antibodies. The only time we use those medicines is for folks who are either so sick that they're hospitalized with the flu or for folks who get the flu, look like they have H1N1 flu, and they have a serious condition. Either their age or a medical condition means that if they do get the flu, they might get very sick. So those are the two types of people we use for these special medicines called antivirals. Remember those little knobs I talked about on the, on the flu organism? One of those knobs is a protein that dissolves the cell wall and lets it blast out of there. These drugs inhibit that protein. So they're trapped in cells and they can't get out. Um, and it, but remember, it only works to slow the flu down. Eventually, your immune system has to step in and it has to take care of this. Ultimately, the body is the hero. Your immune system is the real hero in this flu story. These drugs need to be prescribed by a doctor and they need to be given early in the course of the flu. If you're being treated to keep you from getting worse, you take them about 10 days. If you're being treated because you're sick, you take them about five days. They do make people feel a little under the weather. Like all medicines, they have side effects. So you wouldn't take them for any other reason except this, and your doctor would be the one that would help you decide if you need this medicine. Is that called Yes, the common name is Tamiflu. You may have heard that. And another one is called Relenza. Relenza is actually a nasal spray. Tamiflu is a pill that you could take. How can you protect yourself against the flu? You actually know this. I think you could give this part of the lecture, couldn't you? You could say, OK, this is what I need to do. I know what I need to do, OK? Get vaccinated with both vaccines. Some of you may be a little nervous about vaccines or have questions or concerns about vaccines. I'd love to talk with you about those concerns tonight. Cover your coughs and sneezes with a tissue or, or do the Dracula cough into the crook of your arm. And I think it's really important if you cough or sneeze into a tissue to wash your hands after you do that. Because of course, that virus is in the fluid that you coughed or sneezed and now it's in the tissue and maybe on your hands. Mm -hmm. You should get the, uh, get the shot, but isn't the flu uh, mutating at a very fast pace? So when you the shot only prevent this for one type of this flu? It's a good question. If you get the shot now, is it just going to mutate and you won't, it won't work anymore? It's true. In a year, it will have mutated too much to even be affected by the shot. You're right. So you do have to get a flu shot every single year. Now, fortunately, you don't have to get a tetanus shot every year and a measles shot every year and all these other things every year. But flu is one of those bugs that changes so fast that they have to make a new preparation every single year. This year, they had to make two new ones because we have a circulating strain which only people who are over 65 have actually been in the world when this circulated in the last time. Washing your hands with soap and water or use this hand sanitizer. Soap and water is best because it removes most oil and the cleanliness is more complete. But let's say that you're at the bus stop and you've decided you really need to wash your hands. You can rub what's called an, uh, a hand sanitizer or an alcohol rub on your hands. This is so strong that it will sting if it gets into cuts in your skin. It's very strong. This is not an antibiotic. It kills everything. Um, all the germs on your hands. It's a, it, it essentially an antiseptic. So if you have a little bottle of this in your purse or backpack and you think, I really do need to wash my hands, it would be good for me to do that. You can use a hand sanitizer instead of soap and water. But the best thing is just to wash your hands more frequently. And then avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Now, I don't know about you, but the minute somebody says to me, don't touch your eyes, nose, and mouth, all I can think about is how my eyes are itching and I need to do this. And I've teased people that, well, we'll just tie a big, we'll tie something around your arms so you can't bend your arms, so that you walk around like this all day. It is very hard to avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. So what I say to folks is, wash your hands if you have to touch your eyes, nose, or mouth. Wash your hands. And then touch your eyes, nose, or mouth. And then wash them again. 
so that if you really do have to rub your eyes or your nose, you could still do that. It's very hard to resist the impulse um, if you're told never do that. It reminds me of that joke about uh, that you tell children, stop thinking about monkeys. I don't want you to think about monkeys. Are you thinking about monkeys now? Because the minute somebody says to you not to do it, that's all you can think about. All right. Get enough rest, eat healthy foods, and get some exercise daily. Oh, this is so not exciting, I know. But your immune system is an army or a military force inside you, and armies run on fuel. They have to be rested and they have to be equipped. If you're burning the midnight oil, if you're staying out late, if you're eating, living on Cheetos and Coke, if you're doing things where your immune system is saying, I don't have the building blocks to take care of this, then you end up in a weakened state. If you, the reason I mention exercise is if people get up and move around, that boosts the immune system. Unless they move around too much, like right after the marathon, most people get sick because that much exercise is hard on your immune system, but most of us are not running marathons. So exercise every day makes the immune system more powerful, revs it up, tunes it up, just like a car is tuned up by being driven a little bit. Yeah. Um, one of my biggest questions of why I'm here is about the flu shot thing, because for years we've been much more into homeopathic, uh -huh. and I've always heard that the flu shot in reality can be, is really damaging, um, kind of like antibiotics over the years, or mm -hmm. not as good for you in the long run, and yeah. that that's supposedly a big cause of environmental illness. Um, so I'm just wondering about the flu shots. How. Yeah, yeah. She's mentioning that there's controversy about immunizations in general. Some folks have very strong feelings about whether they should ever use an immunization or a vaccine. And, other, and there, there may be other things you can do for the flu. And you have to know that I'm coming from a very far, far perspective on one side, which is a part of my job is to count the number of deaths, count the number of hospitalizations, count the number of problems. So my information is much more towards using vaccine than trying something else. But I understand there are many strong feelings about this and that families have to think it over. Do you think that's reality or what do you think about that? I actually think that the literature, the evidence-based literature, is very strongly in favor of the vaccine over something else. And the reason I say that is that we've had, I don't know, 30 years or so to study this. Did you guys know that vaccines are the most heavily studied drugs in the world? No other drug you take has been as carefully studied as vaccines. They are endlessly studied over and over because they're the focus of so much attention. So it's probably the safest drug you'll ever encounter. It's more heavily tested, more heavily uh, vetted. Plus, there are systems in place to monitor any side effects of vaccine. That's not really true for lots of other drugs. You know, if you're on a, a blood pressure medicine or you're taking something like insulin, nobody's saying, please call us if you have a bad time with this drug. We need to keep complete records. But if you have a bad reaction to a vaccine, there's an entire system set up to monitor those reactions 24-7. Uh, it's known as the VAERS system, which is the Vaccine Adverse Reaction System. And because I'm a public health doctor, I enter adverse reactions into that system pretty regularly, and sometimes people do have a reaction to a vaccine, it's true. But I think the evidence that's accumulated is that vaccines are a safer option than having a bout of the flu, and that I really encourage people to avoid it if they can. Now, I also think it's important to have good information. In fact, if you look right here, I'm giving you two websites that I have found helpful in my own work, but that's because I do this all the time. But there's also a nurse advice line where you can call and just talk to a person, another person, about whether or not you have the flu. And there's also an 800 number at the CDC where you can have a frank conversation with them about your worries about the H1N1 vaccine. You can just say, what, are, what studies are you doing to make sure this is safe? Now, they've set up this year because the flu vaccine had to be turned out in an eight-month period starting in March, and we don't usually do that. We usually start in this, for the flu season. We usually start producing vaccine earlier, and then we, we treat it in the fall. 
in the winter. So if you're a little concerned about the flu vaccine or if, or if it's something that doesn't make sense to you, one thing is to actually call and just talk with them about your concerns. I actually think you should be able to ask your specific question. What about this disease? What about this consequence? What about my family? Your health is different than anybody else in the room. You have specific issues for your own health. I actually think it's good to get personal advice. But if you look at the big evidence-based literature, in my assessment as working in, as a public health doc, it's far and away leans towards protection with a vaccine. I know that some folks feel that you get maybe some better or richer immunity with getting the, the actual disease. One thing that worries me as a part of my job is to count all the terrible outcomes when people actually got the disease. So I'm pretty anxious about testing that theory on people. I actually am a big believer in vaccination. And part of that has to do with having to count every bad outcome from a vaccine preventable disease for 25 years. It just shifts your, you know, your biases on that side from then on. Um, I actually think it's very important to be able to talk with your own doctor, though. Some people have very special health concerns. They may have allergies to the constituents of the vaccine, or they may have had a bad reaction to a vaccine. You do need to talk with your doctor about that. It's not a good idea, if you know you're not supposed to take it, to forge ahead without talking with someone. I actually want to encourage the young people here not to wait for someone to come and tell you what's important about the flu. I actually think knowledge is power. And I'd really like you very soon to be making your own decisions about your health. You'll need your parents' advice and support. But in a few years, you're going to be an adult. You'll be the only important person making the decisions for your health. And I'd like you, as soon as you can, to learn as much as you can about the things that might threaten your health. So that's why I've provided some of these things. There are handouts. Oops, they're gone. <laughs> we, we, there's some handouts on the bench. Oh, OK, I was going to say, they're now seat cushions. These uh, handouts are seat cushions. But I have a few handouts for you, and one of them is a poster with this on it. Now, when you get home from these things, sometimes the first thing your parents say is, well, what did she say? What happened? So to save you a lot of time, I have a handout just for your parents. And they have some very special concerns because when you're a parent, you live and die with your child's illnesses. It's a big deal when your kid gets sick. So this is just for your parents. And then there's one for you because you're practically grown. You're big, uh, strapping kids now. For all practical purposes, you're an adult, practically. So this is for you. There's one for you. And then there's one, what to do if you get sick. Let's see if I have all that. And, and I actually feel like you should have some control over how you take care of yourself when you're sick. I'd like you to know how to do the best job for yourself when you get sick. And if you think you have the flu, I'd like you to have a good idea about what you can do to make yourself feel more comfortable. All right, here's my, here's my, here's my uh, secret hidden agenda. This is what I came to talk to you about, too. If you think someday you might like to be a part of the team that fights the flu in your community. I'd like you to seriously consider one of these careers. We have predictable, serious shortages of all these careers right now. And all those shortages are going to get so much worse. So if you've ever thought of being a healthcare related professional, I hope that you'll go ahead and consider it. Um, we really could use your help. The health concerns, the health challenges that we all face are probably not going to get completely better. We'll never live in a world where there aren't any health concerns. So I'm hoping you'll consider it. The other thing I'm going to show you is that this is a picture of the public health system. Okay. Some people think the public health system is the Department of Health, or maybe it's the doctor's office or the hospital. But when you have a flu outbreak like we're having now, a pandemic, a worldwide spreading of flu, actually all these groups have to get together and help each other. There's just too much to be done. There's too much at stake. So all of these groups are actually uh, working together. I have regular meetings in my job with firemen, with policemen, with other departments, with pharmaceutical companies, with schools, with, with banks and employers where people work. Because you just can't get through a flu season like this by yourself. 
we're going to have to work together to make sure that we make it as, l as low of a, a, a serious flu season as we can and to make sure that most of us just get a mild illness if we get sick. Sorry? What did the colors Oh, they're random. You know, somebody got a little carried away and thought they would. This is called the egg diagram. We call it the egg diagram. It's a picture of the real public health system because most people think the public health system is a doctor in a hospital. And, but in fact, when we're in trouble, we recruit everybody. We even have a whole cadre of volunteers that are helping us with H1N1 work. If you're, um, if you're a part of a school or you're a part of a bank or you're a part of a, uh, an employer, like a state employee, there, you're able to, uh, to volunteer to help with some of these things if you would like to. You have been a very polite audience, but I wanted to know if you have some, some questions of your own. And I wanted to leave plenty of time, so if you wanted to discuss some other issues related to the flu, we'd have plenty of time to do that. One to two days. H1N1 is much faster, in my experience, than seasonal flu. Um, people are often sick within a day. However, you're contagious the day you're starting to feel funny. You're already contagious. So that's the problem with the flu. Think about that. If you were a virus and you made people so sick that they just fell down on the ground the first hour, then that disease wouldn't spread because people couldn't walk among each other and go to work and school. So you're actually able to transmit the disease the first day that you're infected, even though you don't feel bad yet. Um, how long does it typically last? Is it like a few days or a month? Or a few days. Okay. Um, the ex she asked, how long does it last? A few days. But there's an exception. If you get the flu and your body fights really hard and you're coming back, but your airways are a little naked and beat up, Another germ may land there, a bacteria, and may cause a second infection like a pneumonia. And then you're, you're sick longer. We believe half the people that died in the 1918 pandemic died of a secondary bacterial infection. They got over the flu, but they were weakened, and they, uh, they died of a, of a pneumonia afterwards. Why do flu viruses um, mutate more often than normal viruses? Um, I think it has to do with their peculiar, um, the peculiar way in which they reproduce. Um, they're animal specific and they also have a protein on their coating that allows them to burst out of cells. And they have long ago, eons ago, learned to mix genetic material. So that's why we have pig flu viruses. Eventually, their DNA getting in, uh, their RNA getting into human cells. Um, most viruses don't do that. They're very, they stick to their own kind. They only infect a certain animal a certain way. Flu viruses have had very much success as a virus by sorting their genes with other animal viruses and by having a little uh, a mutation here and a mutation there. Honestly, from a geneticist perspective, it looks really sloppy to me. It's like, why are you doing that? They're reproducing in such a sloppy way and they're making all these mistakes. However, it's led to them being the virus that spans the whole world every year. They call it swine flu because a part, the first thing they characterized was that it was a pig virus. But it won't surprise you to know if you've been reading the paper, it also has bird flu in it and human flu too. So it's like you had three decks of cards, blue, red, and green, and you just threw them up in the air and you picked up cards, eight cards, and some of them are bird, some of them are pig, and some of them are human. This has led to a rapid spread of this disease and an ability to mutate very quickly. Um, will the vaccine ever be, when will it be available in New Mexico schools? I believe the public will be able to get the dose of the H1N1 vaccine within the next 60 days or so. It's already coming in, but in very small amounts. And as you might imagine, we're trying to protect the people that are at the most risk first. Um, pregnant women, children less than two, caretakers for babies less than six months, they're at much higher risk from this vaccine. So they're probably going to get the first doses. But we think everybody who wants a dose can get it. That's what we're counting on. There are people who are naturally old, <laughs> and, 
and they've seen the flu so many times that it's hard for them to come across a flu they haven't seen before. So the older you get, the less likely you are to get infected with a new flu virus. Now, there's an interesting part to that, though. Older people's immune systems start to slow down a little bit. So you might not be so likely to get it, but if you get it, you're in more trouble. And that's because as, the, as we get older, our immune system backs off a little bit every year. And so it's less likely to get it, but once you get it, you may have more side effects or more serious complications. Does that make sense? What would be conditions that would cause you to recommend that schools be closed? Um, in general, schools close when they don't have the staff they need to carry out their work or they don't have enough children that they wouldn't have to go back and do everything over. Do you know what I mean? Like if you have your kids are gone and you're teaching fractions and the rest of them come back after that, you're like, well, this didn't work. We're going to have to go over everything again. So if the school gets so involved that lots of people are home, both teachers and students, it may make sense to close the school because you can't hold education processes. If you had a flu virus that was so dangerous that a high percentage of people who got it were actually getting very sick and being hospitalized, you might consider stopping what we call public gathering if it was that dangerous. This flu virus is actually quite mild. It has caused serious problems for a few people, but most people who get it, they feel bad for several days, but they get over it. So you wouldn't close a school at this point. For, this is called a level one pandemic. It means that while we'd like people to be vaccinated and use hygiene measures, washing your hands and staying home if you're sick, we wouldn't eliminate public gatherings because it isn't that dangerous to most people. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, a couple of questions. Number one, I've heard that uh, eggs that the uh, vaccine is, is made from eggs, what part uh, what part uh, do eggs play in, uh, in the uh, manufacture of the vaccine? Mm -hmm. um, they grow this virus in a special medium that involves the use of raw egg. So if you're a person, in other words, it's like growing it in chicken broth or something, but instead of growing it in a broth or on a, a lot of times bacteria are grown on auger or some other little laboratory format, they're actually grown in eggs. And that means if you're allergic to eggs, there's tiny amounts of egg in the vaccine. So for folks who have a serious allergy to eggs, like their mouth swells up and they have trouble breathing if they eat eggs, they probably shouldn't have the form of the vac this form of this vaccine. Those folks can be placed on antiviral drugs for the flu season, and they should talk with their doctor about that. A second question along the same lines, or maybe not along the same lines, but I've heard or read somewhere that uh, uh, you may think you're, you're, uh, you're over the flu and you have a relapse, the, the, the virus comes back and, and is maybe even a little stronger than than it was at the outset, is that, is that true? It's interesting you say that. I have seen people who have a period of time when they're feeling better and then they feel worse. Often what I think when that happens is the person has a new challenge in addition to the flu, like they were starting to get better and then some germ in their throat or lungs starts to overgrow, like a pneumonia germ. So now the person feels really sick. And they say, well, I, I was better, and now I'm not better. You may have heard on the news a story about a child who got influenza and felt better, and then they went on to have a very serious infection with a germ called Staphylococcus. So that's one explanation is other germs took advantage of the fact that you're a little down and a little tired and your airway's sort of been stripped by this virus and takes advantage of you and something else starts to grow. That's one reason. The last question. Yeah. Uh, 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 lingering cough, is that part of the symptom? That's a good question. It depends on how much damage there is. Remember, your whole little respiratory system has to sort of line itself again. So you're really pretty much coughing up dead cells, and, and your immune system is clearing everything out. Um, some people cough longer than others. If you already had a reason to cough, like you're a smoker, or you had asthma, or you have something else going on in your lungs, it may take you longer to clear up. There are also some bacterial diseases that are very mild, but their most prominent symptom is like the worst cough you ever had. And if you have that, a really bad cough when you weren't very sick, you should talk with your doctor because there's another disease that causes a really long-lasting cough. They call it a 12-week cough. 
hopefully nobody here will get that. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to, to map H1N1 against the 1918 version? I believe they have actually done that. And they believe that this H1N1 was the kind of, of type of virus that was circulating in 1918. It had something we call a virulence factor that this one doesn't have. When viruses are very strong and very destructive and very dangerous, they say they're more virulent. In other words, they're more like a virus. Um, and so this one lacks that virulence protein at this point. We hope it always lacks it. We hope it never finds it. Does that make sense? Okay, so how many of you are going to come with me back to the health department and let me start training you as nurses and pharmacists and <laughs> tomorrow? I need your help tomorrow. Um, you've been so polite and, and so um, such a good audience. Is there a question back there? You okay? People are stretching. They're running out of energy. It's hard to sit still this long, isn't it? Thank you so much for your kind attention. I hope you have a great flu season.